So that was all about a normal semantic segmentation. And uh, the next topic we are going to cover is uh, instant segmentation. And what we will do here is instead of just predicting like uh, which category each pixel belongs to, we will also try to separate different instances uh, of uh, each class. Okay, so here uh, we have a nice example and we have seen this before given an input image. Let's say we have two categories of uh, objects. We have chair and we have table. Then this is something which we will get uh, from semantic segmentation, right? The image on the right. And it's just saying bl black is your background, red is your chair and orange is your table. But next we are going to look into instant segmentation where we will differentiate between uh, these two chairs. We'll say this is chair number one and this is chair number two. So this uh, image or the segmentation map uh, in the center, that's exactly showing you that it's uh, instant segmentation. In this case, uh, you have this instance of chair. This is just one instance. And this is the second instance of chair. So you can differentiate between these two. Okay, so one easy solution for uh, this could be, so if you look at this example, this is an image and this is the semantic segmentation map you got after just performing pixel wise classification, right? Each pixel is telling you which category it belongs to. So it, it could be TV, that's the black as a background. This is a person and this is table. Now, if you, if you look at the segmentation map, you can easily, even without looking at the RGB image, you can say that, okay, there are three person here, right? And once you know there are three person, then you can do something to separate these uh, three instances and maybe create something like this where you have, okay, instead of uh, one, you have three different people here. So it, it's already there. It's just like how you extract or how, how you make that decision, whether there is like one person, two person or three person. And uh, easy, easy hack to that is we have, we have uh, looked into object detection, right? Where given an image, what you can do is you can find a bounding box for each uh, each instance of the uh, uh, of that category, right? So, what if you perform object detection on this image? Then, if you have categories like table and person in that object detector, you will easily get a bounding box for this, and three different bounding boxes for these these three person here, right? And then, what you can do is you can combine that object detection uh, output with the semantic segmentation map. And then you can differentiate between these three different instances. So that's an easy hack for uh, using your semantic segmentation algorithm to perform instance segmentation. And we will see like, uh, that's also like a kind of a state of the art uh, in this problem. So this is showing the result of uh, object detection right, you have bounding boxes around uh, each each object. And when you combine this with this, you can get uh, something like this. Of course, when you will not have these fine boundaries, you will have like maybe straight lines over here. And, but of course, when if you want, you can refine those. Okay, so now we are going to look into uh, one interesting approach uh, for this instance segmentation. And this is something like uh, which will be built upon what we have already uh, seen in this class before. So if you re remember like uh, the object detection lecture where we have this region proposal network and then we looked into fast RCNN, then we also uh, discussed faster RCNN and, <clears throat> and it was trying to solve object detection problem. Given an image, it will draw a bonding box uh, around each of, uh, each of the instances uh, of those object. Now there is extension to that, uh, which is called mask RCNN, and you can use the same structure and add like some uh, uh, some additional uh, loss function or additional network which can perform this segmentation. So then, what you will be able to do is you will be able to leverage uh, on like the detected bounding boxes, and then separate the semantic uh, segmentation map into different instances. So it's kind of combining what we have seen so far for semantic segmentation and what we have seen so far for object detection. So it's integration of both and that will give you instant segmentation. 
So this was a paper, I think in 2017 ICCB, it got best paper award in that conference. And that's, that's really a big deal. And I think for these series of papers, uh, they also got this MAR award, which is kind of Turing award in uh, this computer vision. So they have these series of four papers and these are very popular, very high uh, influential papers. And so let's see like how we can uh, use that faster RCNN to make it predict some of uh, these instant segmentation maps. And we we'll call that this mask RCNN. So if you remember your uh, faster RCNN, the idea there was given an image, there was a region proposal network, which will give you these proposals, right? Different proposals. And then you apply those proposals into the extracted feature map. And then you extract those feature maps and then you predict the, uh, you predict the uh, action, uh, sorry, the object class, right? And you also predict the bonding boxes. So there were like two different heads. It's just showing one here, combining both. And one big difference was there we used to perform region of interest pooling, right? You remember like uh, given a proposal, given the feature map, you have to transform that to a constant resolution or a, or a fixed resolution. So we studied that region of interest pooling there. So this is like the additional semantic segmentation branch, which we need. So what we will do is instead of performing semantic segmentation on the full image, we will take this smaller proposal, perform ROI align, and we will talk about this, what this ROI align is. But right now you can just assume that this is almost similar to uh, your ROI pooling. It's taking this uh, pro uh, proposal, extracting the features from this feature map and converting it to like uh, a fixed resolution, all right? And once you have this fixed resolution, you perform this uh, semantic segmentation similar to like uh, the, the fully, uh, the segment architecture we have, the unit architecture we have. So this is like similar architecture and it will give you the semantic map for this particular object. All right, so now going back to ROI pooling, if you remember, uh, they were discussed like Given a feature map, if you have a proposal, then you have to extract features from this. And there was a loss, uh, a loss of information and there were multiple uh, scenarios here. So one thing was you have to quantize these coordinates so that they perfectly match with the coordinates of the feature map. And for example, in this particular case, if this is your region of interest or uh, your proposal, and this is your feature map, then you can't take values from this pixel location or this pixel location both, right? So what you do is you do a nearest neighbor search. So this coordinate will go here. Similarly, this coordinate will go here. So it's kind of quantization. Uh, what, uh, you have seen that in image binarization as well. So then what will happen is your source uh, proposal was this, and this is your target proposal, which is shown uh, at the back. Now what's happening here is you're kind of losing this region, right? And you're gaining on this region. So this was your exact ground truth, but because of this contradiction, you are shifting your ground truth and saying that this new location is a ground truth. So you have that shift, which includes this in your detection. Now let's try to understand that like using the simple image, this was your ground truth burning box right, for this cat. Now, this is the input image and this is the feature map extracted at a resolution of 16 cross 16. And uh, let's say this image was, I think this is 512 by 512. So there is almost 32 times reduction in the resolution. So you are going from 512 pixels to just 16 pixels. And this bonding box here is uh, 200 pixels wide and the height is 145 pixels. And if you look at the proposal, so then you will have to find the height and width of the proposal as well based on uh, this reduction of uh, resolution. So you can just divide uh, the height and width by 32 because that's how much like you're reducing the resolution. So when you do that, 
you are not getting uh, perfect numbers. You are getting these floats. So this is 6.25 and this is 4.53. So that's kind of a uh, loss of information because you cannot have a window of 6.25 in your feature map. It will have to be a perfect integer. And that's why you do a, uh, a quantization. So this will go to six, this will go to four. And then you have to select like uh, six different pixels here and four different pixels here. So that's quantization number one. The second quantization was you will have to shift them uh, to perfectly match with the feature map. So essentially what will happen is this green region is like what you are gaining on. That's the context. And this blue region is which you are kind of losing. And if you map this back to this image, it means that when you are training this network for detecting cats, you are modifying your ground truth to include some grass over here and you are losing these two borders here. So it might also cut uh, some region of this uh, cat cat object as well. Okay, now let's see how we can fix that. So that's why instead of ROI pooling, we will use ROI align for semantic segmentation. And the reason we need that is in bonding boxes, it won't matter that much, but in semantic segmentation, since you need like very found, fine boundary, right? So such displacement of your uh, ground truth will impact a lot of uh, whatever performance you are getting. Because for example, if the tail is, let's say, uh, it's not, uh, it's covering very small region, right? It's not that uh, thick here. So if you displace uh, by that much amount, then you're kind of, saying that the grass is the tail and you won't have anything in the tail. Because if you compare uh, the loss you are seeing here, the blue region, it will be more than the width of, width of this tail. Okay, so that's why it's very important to have very accurate uh, feature maps extracted for semantic segmentation. Now, so that's fine. Uh, for uh, ROI pooling, you just take the max pooling operation. So you will convert your whatever features you have extracted from this feature map region. So let's say you are planning on getting a fixed feature map of three cross three, then you will just perform max pooling. And again, you will have some loss of information uh, in this operation because your target resolution might not match perfectly to your input resolution of your proposal. So again, it, uh, the width and height should be perfectly divisible by your uh, your target resolution. In this case, it's not. And that's why you're losing all of these pixels here. So at the end, you will see like even these important pixels, you're not considering as cat. Okay, so how we can fix that. So instead of ROI pooling, we will uh, use ROI align. And the idea here is instead of performing the nearest neighbor quantization, we will use a bilinear interpolation Okay, so this we covered last time. And to do by linear interpolation, what we do is, for example, this is your feature map on the background, and this is your uh, region of interest or your proposal. Now, instead of mapping this proposal back to the activation map to perform this quantization, we try to discretize this proposal itself. Okay. So what we will do is we will create a grid map inside this proposal. And we'll discuss like how many uh, grid points we need. And then what we will do is instead of directly using the activation values from the feature map, for example, for example, this pixel location or this pixel location, we will try to get an estimate if we are at this location, what value it should have. So it will, it will be a bilinear interpolation of all the neighboring pixel values. Okay, so for, uh, to get activation for this region, it will make use of the, uh, the neighboring pixels and same for this. So one way you're trying to modify your activation map, but you're also trying to kind of average them. You are, you're not losing any information. And then what will happen is if you're doing bilinear interpolation, you are not shifting your uh, region of interest. You're, so you're not losing anything or you're not gaining anything. And that's benefit number one. The second benefit is 
you can avoid the second loss when you were trying to match your uh, extracted feature map to the target uh, resolution, right? So what you can do is you can select the number of uh, uh, grid uh, points in this uh, feature map based on whatever target you have. So if your target is let's say two cross two or it's three cross three, so you will select that many points which are exactly divisible by the resolution of your target. So in that way, you won't lose any information when you perform uh, that operation. All right. So now let's see like how you can uh, do this uh, bilinear interpolation. So this is the input image, the same image, 512, 512. And that's the ground truth bonding box, same, uh, same uh, resolution here. You use your CNN to extract the feature map, 16 cross 16. And then your uh, region of interest is uh, this particular location, okay? Now again, uh, the same computation, the width is 6.25. The height is 4.53 and you don't care about like if you get integers or not. Okay, so you just take these values. Now what you will do is you can find the coordinates of uh, these four uh, these four corners of this uh, proposal, right? Because uh, you, you are, you are down sampling 32, 32 times. So you know the coordinate of uh, these locations, right? And you can also get the coordinates of these by just dividing that uh, coordinate value with 32. So this is giving you 9.25 and six. Again, these are fractions. These are not perfect integer values. Okay, so we are just taking a crop of this region and we get something like this. And as you see, like the width is 6.25 height is 4.53, right? We'll keep these fractions. We won't convert or quantize them to uh, perfect integers. And, okay. So, and let's say our target or resolution for extracting the features is three cross three. Then, yeah, I don't know why we have this slide here. So this is just showing that if you, if you do three cross three, your ROI uh, pooling, you were losing this information. But in this case uh, with ROI line, we won't have to do that. Okay, now you have three cross three uh, target resolution. What you do is you just divide your, this input proposal into three cross three. And since you don't care about whether you're getting integers or fractions, you can perfectly do that. All right, so that's step number one. And once you have that, let's assume that uh, you get some values for uh, these locations. Then what you can do is whatever values you get, you can directly take a max pooling or whatever operations you want, and you will get this feature map. So each of these regions will give you corresponding values for your uh, target activation. Okay. Let me see, I think there is a question. So question from Mohammed, uh, is it possible to use triangular shape instead of rectangular window? So, I mean, it's not about whether it's possible or not. I mean, of course, I mean, whatever operations we are, we are going to discuss, you can perform those operations on a triangle as well. But uh, two questions. The first question is why exactly you need triangle? And I kind of understand that you're saying that you're uh, you might be thinking your input object might be of a uh, triangular shape, right? So that could be one motivation. But think about your uh, activation maps in triangular shape. How will you perform convolution on that? So right now, the way we perform convolution mean your feature map or activation map should be rectangular or square, right? And then you have a kernel and you perform correlation and convolution operation. And that might be an interesting idea and I don't know if researchers are exploring that or not, but then you can have in fact like triangular feature maps as well. So that might be more efficient than square, but I'm, I'm not sure like if someone is exploring that or not. But right now the way we have CNNs designed, uh, that, that's not possible. Okay, so, all right, so, 
where were we? So we divided this into uh, three cross three. And so when you divide this into three cross three, again, you have the uh, width and height. So you can also compute like height and width of uh, these smaller uh, boxes here. Again, you will get some kind of fractions. You, you can also get perfect integers, but we don't care whatever we get. So based on 6.25, the width of this will be two point something. And again, this will be like one point something. So this is 2.08, this is 1.51, okay? And now we'll see like how we get values for this and we can repeat like the same operations for the uh, other locations. So dividing by three cross three, you get this box. Now, what you do is each box, you take four, uh, four different locations. And again, you can, you can take uh, more locations as well. You can have uh, nine locations. You can divide into three cross three, or uh, you can have four cross four. It's just like the resolution you want. But in this particular case, we are just taking uh, four different uh, points. And again, if you think about this, what you're doing is you are dividing this region again into nine different locations. So you are dividing into like three cross three, uh, three cross three uh, partition, right? And these are just the centers or the intersection of those lines. Okay, now once we do that, we'll have to get values for these four locations using bilinear interpolation. So we'll get value for this, we'll get a value for this and similarly this. And then finally, for this location, we have those four values and then we can perform either max pooling or we can perform average pooling, whatever we want. That will give you the target value for this location, okay? So let's see how we can get these values. So for this location, so bilinear interpolation, you know that for any location, what you do is you search for the neighboring locations for which you already have the values, okay? So now if you reflect back to your original activation map, each of this block is representing one uh, pixel location or one activation, right? So each of these uh, blocks will have some uh, value and that's what we are showing here. So this one has value 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on and so forth, right? Now, this was our target location, this over here, okay? So we, we take this location. So to get the value, we'll have to perform bilinear interpolation using these four values because these are the closest values to this location. And this is the simple equation of uh, bilinear interpolation which we have discussed in the last lecture as well. So you can, what you can do is you can first perform bilinear interpolation between these two, you will get a value somewhere at this location. You can perform bilinear interpolation of these two, you will get this. And depending upon like where uh, on this line, this point uh, loca is, is located, you can again perform bilinear interpolation along this direction. And that will give you the value for this location. And similarly, you can repeat that for other three locations, okay? So for this one, the nearest uh, pixel ones, pixel uh, points are this, this, and these two. So again, you can perform the interpolation. So similarly, you get uh, four different values for this region here. And then what you can do is, uh, depending upon what operation you want to do. For example, in this case, we are doing just max pooling. So out of these four, this 0.51 uh, has the maximum value. So for this region, we get 0.51. Okay, so similarly, you will perform the same set of operations for other blocks over here, and you can fill in the rest of the value. So in this case, you are not like losing any information while performing this max pooling you're not losing any information uh, because you don't have to perform any quantization of these coordinates. So you try to estimate like these values using interpolation. And that is ROI align. And this is again a nice animation just showing 
what different values you will get for this proposal. Okay. Now, going back to the original network, you have the original image. Uh, you use the CNN to extract the feature map. This was your region of interest. And what you did is you converted these, uh, these set of features to a fixed uh, sized activation map. And then these activation maps are corresponding to this particular object over here. Okay. So now what will happen is you might have different shaped objects. Right? So for example, this particular cat here. So the you will get like a very wide rectangle here. But again, if you perform ROI align, you are going to get activation map or activation features for this cat as well, which will have the same shape. <clears throat> and the reason we do that is because you can't you can't have different shaped uh, activation maps to uh, to train your network. So you will have to predefine the shape of your network, right? The number of parameters you want. And that's why you have to transform all the proposals to the fixed resolution. Now, if you compare uh, your ROI align operation with your ROI pooling, so ROI pooling was the first step of quantization was uh, making you lose this uh, dark blue region here. And you were gaining this uh, green region and then transforming it to like a fixed shaped uh, activation map, you were losing all these pixels here. So effectively you were only considering these locations. But in ROI align, you will perfectly get like this uh, red rectangle here. You won't be uh, losing anything. But if you look back at the receptive field of that, so the values uh, you will extract for that feature map uh, will be from uh, this green region here because you're performing bilinear interpolation. So to get values for a box over here, you will also make use of the activation at this location. So essentially what you're doing is you're using the uh, features extracted from a bigger region. So you're also considering the context, which is good because context sometimes help you. You can, you can determine like what object is present just based on uh, what's the background, right? Because if, uh, for example, if you have an image uh, where you have to detect clouds, and if you see like some kind of a uh, white blobby region and the background is blue, then it's easy for you to detect it's a cloud. So that's why uh, including context uh, always helps. It's not going to make it worse. But in this case, you were losing information uh, which was not good. Okay. Now uh, let's look at the uh, structure of this mask RCNN. So for after performing that ROI align, you will get uh, your feature map, for example, 7 cross 7, 256, and use this for maybe the classification task, detecting like which uh, category, object category you have, and uh, the regression on the bounding box, the, the small shift you want in like your proposal to make it perfectly match with the ground truth. So this is uh, the original faster R scene inversion we, we discussed. The only additional thing is uh, this bottom branch where we are trying to predict the mask. And again, this is a fully con uh, convolutional network. And instead of mapping uh, that region to seven cross seven, we are mapping it to 14 cross 14. You can see that it's a bit higher resolution, which means that you will have more uh, fine grained details. And then eventually you are <clears throat> trying to increase uh, this from 14 to 28 cross 28. All right, so this 256 is just your uh, number of channels and you can see that the final mask you have you have 80 different channels and these 80 channels are like for 80 different categories of uh, the objects you have in ms coco data set so if you uh, if you train it for uh, pascal voc you will need like 21 or 20 because there we have 20 categories and each channel uh, will represent one category so each channel will be like a heat map of 28 cross 28 pixels and each pixel will be, it could be grayscale like ranging from a zero to one. If it's highly active, it's saying that that particular object is present. If it's not, then uh, the object is not present. And of course, when you can perform some kind of post processing after, after the prediction. So for this prediction, uh, what you do is 
because uh, your image is flat, right? It's a flat 2D region. It's a projection of 3D world. So in 3D world, you have you can have multiple objects uh, in your line of sight. Some might be visible, some might not be visible. But when you project that to a 2D space, then what's happening is at each pixel location, you can only have one object present, right? And whichever whichever object is like in the foreground. And it could be that in, for example, uh, let's look at this particular image. So in the 3D world, at this location, you also have a road present, right? This pixel also belongs to road. But when you uh, project this to a 2D image, then it's a flat region, two dimensional image. So this pixel only belongs to cat. So similarly, each pixel belongs to only one category. You can't have multiple categories. But if you look at this uh, prediction here, we have 80 different channels. So each pixel, you are predicting 80 different values. And a nice way to make a good convergence of a training is you can perform a softmax operation across these 80 channels. So if you remember softmax, softmax tries to convert your predictions into probabilities. And the way it does it uh, is it will, it will try to make uh, the most activated prediction, uh, the actual prediction, and try to bring all the other predictions close to zero. So it, it's ensuring that you only have one uh, highly active class. And that, uh, that will help you here because at each pixel location, as you know, you can only have one object and then softmax will try to just enforce that. And in the post-processing, what you can do is you will have uh, 80 different values for each pixel location. You can only pick the highest highly activated value and that object will be present. You can just ignore the others because uh, after a train model, I mean, it won't be perfect. You might get multiple high activations for the same region. Okay, so that's why you need some kind of post-processing. So that's like one uh, simple hack, uh, which makes sure that your predictions are meaningful. Now let's uh, have a look at some of the examples. So for this input image, this is the proposal. And uh, what you do is you actually project this to a fixed shape uh, resolution, right? For, for example, 14 cross 14, and eventually you're getting 28 cross 28. Now, if your rectangular, rectangle is something like this, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a square, but you're converting this to square. So the segmentation map you're getting is something like this. Okay, so then what you will have to do is, so, Whatever uh, change in aspect ratio you observed when you transformed this feature map to this fixed uh, feature map, okay? So you transformed from 6.25 to three and 4.53 to three. So you know the ratio, like you decreased uh, the aspect ratio for this particular dimension and you increased for this to make them equal, but you, you know that ratio. So you can exactly use that ratio and convert these uh, convert this uh, square uh, square shape prediction to the original uh, original like uh, aspect ratio you have for the object and this you can see is clearly matching uh, with the object over here and this is kind of a soft prediction which means that you for each pixel location you have a value between 0 and 1 and you can easily uh, perform a binarization on that using a threshold which will convert each pixel value to either zero or one, and that will give you the final mask, okay? Now let's look at some of the examples. So you can see that uh, it's pretty impressive. I mean, you have these elephants here and it can not only detect these, it can easily draw nice boundaries around, around those objects, right? You can see like how nice this boundary is. And it can also detect like the elephant on the back. And it's even for humans, like if you only look at this particular region, it will be hard to estimate whether there's, there's an elephant or not, right? But what's happening is when you're extracting the features, uh, essentially mean you're uh, saying that you are looking at this region, but your receptive field is much bigger. So you're also making use of pixel values at uh, these locations. So the context is helping 
And since uh, the network knows that you have elephant here, you have these features and making use of that context, uh, I think the network is able to predict that this is elephant as well. And if you can see like this image, it's very crowded and how it can easily separate like these people in the crowd. So it's, it's, it's quite impressive. Even for this car image, you can see that you have uh, these cars present at different resolutions. So this is pretty big, right? If you compare this with the car in the background. So there's, there's a huge variation here. And using classical uh, methods, you remember like we were talking about uh, image pyramids to address these issues. But with this uh, kind of approach, you don't need feature pyramids because you have like proposals of different shape and sizes. And uh, during a training, your network is seeing like all these variations. So it has the capability to detect like car at different resolutions. So you don't have to do anything extra, uh, extra for that. And again, when you can see here, like the parked cars here, like the network can easily separate the instances. And same is true for these donuts here. Okay, so these are some more examples. And that's it I have uh, for today. So any questions? So question from Furkan, uh, is it possible to configure the setting to detect and mask only one class? Like detecting only one class, of course you can do that. So what you can do is just change uh, this final layer. Okay, so of, I mean, there are two ways. So one way will be if you want, if you have a new uh, data set where you only have one object category, right? And you want to detect that object. So what you can do is you can divide it into two. You can say foreground or background. And you will have to modify this last layer instead of predicting 80 different channels. Either you can just predict one channel which will say that whether object is present or not, or you can have two channels. So one channel will be background. It will say whether this pixel is background or not. The second channel will say whether the foreground object is present or not. So both phase is fine and both phase works. And then you can train this network or fine tune this network on your data set. So that's one way. The second way could be if you don't want to uh, train your network, you just want to detect like foreground objects then what you can do is you can simply uh, take the output of uh, this uh, this feature map and just add the values of these different 80 channels and then just take the average so that average prediction will be like object is present or not but of course mean then you're not differentiating between different object categories right it will just say foreground or background All right, so any other question? So this is a, this is a pretty interesting uh, approach for object detection and segmentation. And uh, we have been, I mean, researchers have been trying to to extend this to videos for activity detection and maybe uh, object segmentation in videos. And there are some uh, successful uh, approaches there, but still I think there are some limitations of this method. And one of I mean, personally, I think uh, this is not like how uh, we detect objects. So if you look back at this particular image, so, I mean, exactly, we don't know how our brain works, but if we try to understand, then the interpretation, we don't, I mean, I don't think I'm like trying to, trying to detect these objects by like sliding uh, different proposals or trying different proposals and seeing whether this proposal is cat, cat or not, right? I just look at this image and I'm trying to group these pixels and then making some inference, okay, the texture looks like cat. So it's kind of, I'm directly looking at image and trying to infer 
uh, in info based on some kind of grouping, right? So we don't need proposals to shift like left and right, try multiple proposals and then refine the boundary. So that's kind of, it works and it's it's a very, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, very nice solution. It works pretty well. We have good results, but uh, it has a lot of memory consumption because of all those proposals. So even for like a simple image, what you do is you have maybe thousand, ten of eight, eight thousand or ten thousand proposals, right? And then you have to select them and downsample them to maybe two thousand proposals, and then you also have proposals for the background. So all of that is like a computationally expensive. And with images, it's fine, but when we move to high dimensional data, such as videos, that becomes like problematic and it's very challenging because in video videos, you have temporal extent as well. So if let's say you're just working on 16 frames, then those uh, 10,000 proposals will be more than 100,000. And then dealing with that amount of proposals and trying to fit that into your GP memory, it's not, not feasible. And then we have to apply different tricks, like try to reduce the proposals, try to re reduce the resolution of our videos. And of course, then the performance is not that good. So uh, a different approach for performing this segment, uh, this uh, object detection or maybe segmentation, uh, it could be like a single shot approach where you don't have to look into these proposals. All right, you just look at the image and you design a network, something like an auto encoder, something like this maybe. And then it should directly say like uh, the way it's doing here, it should say, and then it should be also able to separate these instances uh, through some mechanism. So tagging is one way where what you do is for each pixel, you predict like some kind of tag and then one instance will have a similar tag, right? So for example, you tag uh, this particular uh, car as one. So all these pixel locations will have value one and a different instance will have values two. So that's called tagging. So that's another interesting approach, how you separate instances uh, and have the simpler architecture. Because if you compare this architecture with that faster RCNN or mask RCNN, it's pretty simple, right? You just have encoder and decoder. So you're just trying to group pixels together, extract features learn what card looks like and then trying to just localize it instead of just sliding different windows and trying multiple proposals. So that's the uh, alternative to this, uh, this region proposal based method. And there are some good uh, papers, I think a single shot uh, detection SSD and then we have a uh, YOLO. You look only once, I think that's the title. And there are many extension of uh, those papers as well. And they, they are pretty competitive. They also works uh, similar to this in terms of performance. So I think you should be aware of that as well. And if you're interested in like uh, this problem of object detection, I think those two are the papers which you should look into. So they are uh, YOLO and SSD. Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, then uh, I think we can end it here today.